Es el Estadio Olímpico en Chihuahua que registraba... El pase es interceptado y se los va a devolver. Touchdown. Así que señores y señores, la pelota está en el aire y los amigos a la gran final. I recently released a video about American football in Japan. I was someone who originally thought that there were only large football leagues in the US and Canada. I came across football in Japan who was shocked and thought their league was amazing and well organized. In that video, which you can find here, I talked about Japan's amateur league, the X League, and how even though football isn't their most popular sport, it was much more popular than I originally thought. And they do have fairly competitive college and high school teams throughout the country. Soon after my video was released, Japan actually smoked the US under 20 team in the World Championship Finals, making it their first time they've ever beaten the US team in that event. Not only did they win in their under 20 game, Japan's national team also beat the Ivy League All-Star team in this year's Dream Bowl, 10 to five. The Dream Bowl is an annual game these two teams play, and this was the first time Japan has ever beaten the Ivy League team in this game. When I made that video, I was flooded with comments that were like, hey, my guy, how could you be this much of a fool? They literally play football everywhere. I started realizing that there were football leagues in Europe, China, Brazil, Italy, Austria, Germany, and many other countries. So I decided that I wanted to start making more videos on international football leagues. And that leads us to this video, where I'll be talking about football in Mexico. No, 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 not the most popular sport, both internationally and in Mexico, that's actually called soccer, but real football. The kind of football where your foot hardly even touches the ball at all. The kind of football that has two O's in its name, like the good lord intended. I'm talking about American football. American football is actually Mexico's second most popular sport, according to a Forbes article from 2019. They have teams all the way from youth football to a legit professional league. Minus the US, there are more viewers of the NFL in Mexico than in any other international country. Just look at these viewership stats from this past year. This is a huge sport in Mexico, and it's growing every year. Some of their colleges are even sending players to the NFL. So, I thought, what better country to dive into next on my football journey than our neighbors in Mexico? You're watching Gridiron History with Kyle, and this is the story of football in Mexico. How did American football make its way to Mexico? There are a few theories as to why football became popular in Mexico and when it was first played and not a lot of written evidence backing these theories up. The book, Touchdown, An American Obsession, lists two theories as to when football was first played in Mexico. The first one I saw was similar to how it was introduced in Japan. U.S. Marines in Veracruz in 1896 played for fun, and when they left Veracruz, they left footballs and other football materials with locals there. One of these locals who got a hold of these materials was the son of the state governor, Raul de Esa, he was someone who knew of football after studying at American institutions. In the city of Jalapa, him and his buddies may have been the first Mexicans to play American football in Mexico. For the next couple of decades, football was predominantly just a curiosity among elites. The next theory stems from a man named Arthur Constantine. He arrived in Mexico to cover political events and married into a prominent Mexican family. His wife, Amanda Moran de Constantine, was a well-established professor at both Mexico City College and UNAM. Arthur got hooked up with students at UNAM around the 1920s who, like Raul de Esa, spent time in the States and knew of football. Around 1928, Constantine helped start a team with two guys referenced as the Noriega brothers, Alejandro and Leopoldo. The team was called La Osos, or the Bears, and later renamed to the Pumas. The team's colors were blue and gold, mimicking the Noriega brothers' favorite college program, Notre Dame. 
another guy referenced on Mexico's Collegiate League's website, was Jorge Braniff. It was hard to find information on Jorge, but he supposedly helped finance the team and helped them get the equipment required to play. After doing some research, I'm pretty sure Jorge Brana's father was a very successful businessman in Mexico. Jorge and his brother, who I think was named Alberto, were also said to be pretty successful businessmen and were active in the athletic community in Mexico. Jorge helped organize the first football tournament in Mexico, and the sport took off from there. In 1929, UNAM played Mississippi College, where they lost 28 to zero. The president of Mexico at the time, Emilio Portes Hill, was even in attendance. These two teams would play each other 11 more times, with their last matchup being in 1975. Starting in 1933, Mexico had its own collegiate league, with UNAM being the most dominant program in the league, winning every national title from 1933 to 1945. They became the first team from Mexico to play in an American Bowl game, where they played the Southwestern Pirates in 1945 and got smashed 35-0. A little disclaimer, during 1945, many of the country's collegiate football teams were canceled during World War II. It's still cool though that they got to play in it. They went on to win 22 national titles between 1933 and 1967. U.S. influence was very prevalent for UNAM up until the 40s, with eight of their first 11 coaches being American. I mean, their first coach was Reginald Root, who would go on to be Yale's head coach that very same season. The Yunnan Pumas also developed an intense rivalry during these early years with the Borros Blancos of the school IPN, two of the bigger schools in Mexico. Borros Blancos has now turned into the Aguilas Blancas, and the rivalry is still played today and just as big. You can check on a lot of cool information about this game by checking out this documentary Vice made a few years back. This game draws in major crowds and really just highlights how popular football is in Mexico. Another big time Mexican college football rivalry game that started in the 40s as well, was between the Borregas Salvajes of Monterrey Tech and the Antetico Tigres of UANL. Both of these teams still have great programs today. By the 40s, football had trickled down into high school and youth leagues. The sport grew more going into the 50s and 60s, where it died down a little in the late 60s, early 70s due to violence in Mexico. Specifically in 1968, the year that Mexico was set to host the Summer Olympics. Here's a little bit of high-level history of what was going on in Mexico at the time of 1968. Keep in mind, this is my first time diving into this topic, so if it looks like I missed a huge detail on what I'm about to say, I apologize. And please comment below to give us more insight into what was going on during this time. From my understanding, prior to 1968, there were a lot of issues regarding workers' rights in Mexico. Any blue-collar strike that occurred in the country was typically shut down with military intervention. This bled into many colleges and more white-collar and middle-class jobs. There were even doctor strikes in Mexico in 1965. Their president at the time, Diaz Ordaz, was having none of it. He never gave in to the strikes, usually meeting the protesters in an authoritative manner, leading to many arrests and sometimes even deaths. UNAM and IPM were two colleges in Mexico that experienced a lot of this chaos. There were all kinds of protests and strikes during this time, leading to military intervention at a lot of these colleges. Many football games and seasons would get canceled during this time due to riots that would occur during extracurricular activities. A term I keep seeing during my research that I ended up looking into was porros. Porros are violent groups in Mexico that start conflicts at sporting events or protests, kind of like hooligans in the UK for soccer that just fight fans for the fun of it. I believe though that the difference between Mexican porros and English hooligans is that hooligans seem to mainly be toxic fans who are just looking to fight for fun. Porros, on the other hand, are rumored to be hired at times to pose as students at these events and strategically cause chaos to get certain extracurricular activities canceled. This is a good way to break up student gatherings or protests and make it look like these groups are violent and are up to no good. The government can plant these violent groups into these protests to take away from the main message that they were trying to convey. The tension blew up on October 2nd, 1968, just a few days before the opening ceremony of the Summer Olympics in Mexico. Mexican armed forces opened fire on a group of unarmed civilians in the Tlatelolco section of Mexico City who were protesting. The official report at the time states that 44 people died. People actually think, now that more evidence of what happened has come out, that upwards to 300 to 400 people may have died and around 1,345 people were arrested. Reports have recently been released stating that Mexico's armed forces were told by the Mexican government to shoot the protesters. There's evidence now of snipers on rooftops shooting at protesters and gunmen inside of buildings doing the same thing. 
Many bystanders, reporters, and children died as a result from the shooting. Portals have been present, it seems, in most of Mexico's college football history. There would be stoppages to American football due to the riots that they caused in the late 70s and early 80s. I even saw an article online reporting on a riot started in 2018 due to Portos. In this attack, several students were injured and two had severe stab wounds. Anyways, let's get back to football. From 1933 to 1968, Mexico's college league was called Liga Mayor. From 1966 to 1976, the league was called Liga Nacional Colegio. In 1977, the UNEFA was created. The English translation of this is the National Student Organization of American Football. This was the main league until 2010, where there was a split in an attempt to separate schools based on whether or not they were private or public schools. Their rival league at the time was named CONADIP, or the C-O-N-A-D-E-I-P. Since COVID though, it seems like only ONEFA remains and is the current collegiate league. The Liga de Football Americano Profesional, or the LFA, is Mexico's professional league. It started in 2016 with only four teams. The league has done well and has grown, and as of 2024, there are nine teams. There was a rival league founded in 2018 called Football Americano de Mexico, or the FAM. Even after having to take two seasons off due to COVID, the league tried to come back and they had a season in 2022, but they ended up shutting down the league afterwards due to financial reasons. Football is very popular in the high school level in Mexico too. Many high school teams in Texas that are close to the border like to schedule teams from Mexico for their non-conference games during the season. According to an article from 2022, written by the Daily News in Galveston, Texas. This is a very common thing in Southern Texas. In this article, they covered a game between Dickinson High School and the high school team for UANL. During this trip, the UANL team played both Dickinson High School and Texas City High School. It's a great way for these teams to gain experience and play in probably the most intense high school football environment that the US has to offer. They just do high school football differently in Texas, and it's basically a religion out there. It looks like many of the high school teams in Mexico are actually affiliated with their respected college programs. They tend to run teams from young children all the way up to the collegiate level. Some schools even have women's teams. Now, I want to get more in depth on how the ONEFA, Mexico's college league, and the LFA, Mexico's professional league, works. Their main college league is broken up into four categories. Liga Mayor, Liga Intermedia, Liga Juvenil, Liga Infantil. The Liga Mayor is broken up into two conferences, the Big 14 and the National Conference. There are 33 total teams in the league, and only teams from the Big 14 can compete for a national championship. Teams in the National Conference have a chance to be promoted to the Big 14 by winning their conference playoff. The champion of the National Conference replaces the last place team of the Big 14 in the next season. The National Conference has a 16 playoff to decide their champion. The Big 14 has an 18 playoff to decide their national champion. The ONEFA is led by some pretty great teams like Borregas Salvajes Monterrey, who have claimed 17 national championships. Just like any great American program, Monterrey teams have been controversial in the past, as they've been accused numerous times of recruiting star players from local public schools. Other good programs include Autentico Tigres of UANL. the Pumas CU of UNAM that we talked about earlier. Perros Blancos of IPN. And Aguilas Blancas of IPN. The LFA is Mexico's professional American football league. Their seasons are played in the springtime, from early March to April. They have a four-team playoff to determine their league champion. Their championship game is called Tazón Mexico, or the Mexico Bowl. The LFA game is similar to how football is played in the U.S., as they're using NFL rules during the games. As I showed earlier, as of the 2024 season, there are currently nine teams in the LFA. The Caldeos, the Dinos, the Fundadores, the Galgos, the Gallos Negros, the Jefes, the Mexicas, the Raptors, and the Reyes. The Caldeos defeated the Raptors for the 2024 season, 34-14, to win their second Tazón Bowl. Teams can now have up to 16 foreign players on a team, which is an increase from previous seasons, where they could only have 12. 
I personally think that this is huge in order to continue to have the sport grow. In my last video, I said how in Japan's league, the X League, they only allow 4 import players per team. Limiting forward players does make it so that you can have a better chance for local players to actually play on the team and to be more involved. But there's something to be said about bringing in more foreign players, especially for a sport that is predominantly played in only one country. The more experienced and knowledgeable football players you can get to play in your league, the more entertaining it should be to watch, which would drive in more fans, more funding, and ultimately lead to the sport becoming more popular and having more domestic involvement. The LFA is a professional league that does pay its players. Now, how much do they make, you may ask? Well, I'm not exactly sure at the moment. On Wikipedia, it states that the LFA has a salary cap that's equivalent to around 100,000 US dollars. But I've also seen reports that state that the number could be closer to around 60,000 US dollars. I've also seen reports where the average player makes around only $500 a month in the league. So I'm not really sure. If anyone has a better idea of what salaries are like in the LFA, please educate us in the comments below. The next thing I want to talk about is the NFL's involvement with football in Mexico. The NFL has played a total of 12 times in Mexico, with 7 preseason games and 5 regular season games. They've played mainly in Mexico City, but also in Monterrey. The first ever regular season NFL game played outside the US was in fact in Mexico City in 2005, when the Arizona Cardinals played the San Francisco 49ers. We're in Mexico City at the Estadio Azteca with 105,000 fans. This game drew in the NFL's largest crowd ever at the time, totaling 103,467 fans. In 2007, the NFL launched its International Series, where they would play one international game a season at Wembley Stadium in London. This occurred from 2007 until 2012. From 2013 to 2015, they held two games per year. In 2016, the International Series expanded to Mexico, and from 2016 to 2024, Mexico has hosted four regular season NFL games. The last season an NFL game was in Mexico was in 2022. There is no game scheduled to be played in Mexico for the 2024 season, and this is likely due to the fact that the stadium they typically play at, Estadio Azteca, is undergoing renovations. Football is very popular in Mexico, but there aren't many current NFL players with Latino descent currently playing. According to a report by the Institute of Diversity and Ethics in Sports, there were just 12 players in the NFL who identified as Latino. This makes up less than 1% of the players in the NFL. Census data in 2020 showed that Latinos made up around 19% of the U.S. population. Marissa Solis, Senior Vice President of Global Brand and Consumer Marketing for the NFL, announced this year that after researching what groups of people were watching the NFL, it showed that Latino viewership increased by about 11% this past football season, and that about 70% of Latinos she surveyed considered themselves NFL fans. The NFL's involvement in growing the sport internationally is very important to the success of these international football leagues. Both representatives from Japan and Mexico state time and time again that they see large increases in popularity and involvement in American football after NFL teams travel to that country to play. The last couple things I want to do to wrap up this video are 1. Show ways how you can watch football in Mexico and 2. Show what kind of content is currently out there that a football fan can enjoy to learn more about football in Mexico and stay updated on it. For the LFA, the professional league, you can watch games by going to their Facebook page where they typically post links to the streams for their games as well as their main website at lfa.mx. I will say, on their Facebook page, they also provide links to different LFA team stores where you can buy merch for other teams, like this cool polo for the Mexicas. It's similar to the Onetha, their collegiate league. You can watch their games by clicking on their live broadcast link or going to their Facebook page. If you want gear for the college teams, you'll most likely find luck by just searching the teams individually and going to their team stores. I also found a lot of cool content creators that cover football in Mexico. One of my favorites was a media group called Receptor. On YouTube, they mainly post videos from the Collegiate League, where they have game film from the sideline of the game. It gives you this kind of unique and intimate experience for their games, where you can hear the crowd and the players. It reminds me of the Skycam coverage ESPN provides for some of their college games, where you can hear the atmosphere of the game rather than the sports commentators. Another channel I found was Maximo Avance, who posts all sorts of highlights surrounding football in Mexico, from the NFL to ANEFA to even their youth leagues. They also have a website where they post articles and videos covering everything that has to do with football in Mexico. There are two YouTube channels that post both Onefa and LFA highlights. 
One is called EG and the other is CFFN. Honestly, the best place to watch LFA highlights though is the LFA's own YouTube channel where they will post cool moments from all their games throughout the season. If you want to learn more about international football as a whole, an awesome website you can head to is AFI or American Football International, where you can learn about all the different leagues globally, such as the Canadian Football League, the European Football League, the X League in Japan, and many more leagues. If you're looking for a more casual YouTube channel to watch for what it's really like to play in some of these international leagues, I strongly suggest that you head over to the channel Adventure Athlete. Clark Hazlett is a vlogger on YouTube who has documented his time playing football since he was in college. For the past few years, he's been posting some great content of him playing internationally in countries such as France, Brazil, the Czech Republic, and Mexico. He's now an assistant coach for a team in Prague and is still documenting his time there. Definitely check out his channel if you want to see what it's like to be a football player in the LFA for Mexico. I'll close this video by saying I'm very impressed with what Mexico has going on in American football. Their collegiate league specifically seems to have a lot of cool history built into them and their professional league has recently been doing very well. I'm excited to start diving into these teams and learning more about football in Mexico going into this next football season. Thank you for watching Gridiron History with Kyle. If you like what you see, make sure you subscribe to the channel as I'll be posting more videos like this in the future. Feel free to reach out to share your thoughts or if you have any suggestions for future episodes.